When Donald Trump became president, America witnessed a rise in white nationalism, in hate crimes, and in divisive conspiracy theories. But a lot of people thought that was a new phenomenon, that it was somehow reactionary behavior to Donald Trump's rhetoric and ideology. The fact is, that isn't true. The fact is, it's quite the opposite. You see, Donald Trump was put into office by white nationalism, by divisive conspiracy theories, and by a long history of white supremacy in this country. Conspiracies of war against white America, conspiracies of the government attacking white Christian America. These conspiracies have existed in white communities across America for decades. Donald Trump simply provided legitimacy to these conspiracies by using key and designated language in his campaign that caused white America to circle in a shark frenzy and cast their votes. Now how do I know this? How can I say this so confidently? Because I come from a white little town in North Carolina where I learned white supremacy. Racism is so casual where I'm from, it's culture. I'll say it again, racism is so casual, it's culture. And that culture breeds the next generation of white supremacists. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about that cycle of white supremacy that has yet to be broken. I want to talk about the silent complicity of white America whenever white supremacy is challenged. I want to talk about the ignorance of white America as it pertains to identifying and stopping white supremacy. Because you see, white supremacy is the single most dangerous thing in America to anybody who doesn't look like me. But every time white supremacy rears its ugly head, we treat it like it's a new dog doing new tricks. No, it's the same dog, same tricks. And I'm here to tell you that if we don't change how we treat the dog, it's going to keep doing the same trick. It's going to keep biting. I was raised in the mountains of western North Carolina in a white little neck of the woods, often referred to as a holler. I grew up with the Confederate flag in my front yard, and my neighbor had one in his, and this neighbor in his, and the guy down the road, and everywhere. That flag was a sign of our heritage. At least that's what I was told. What heritage, might you ask? A heritage of simple, hard-working Christian folk. Patriots who love their country and their neighbor. As long as your neighbor looks like you. Because I'm here to tell you, I didn't have any black neighbors. In fact, you had to go about 20, 30 minutes down the road before you got to the black neighborhood. Or where I'm from, they refer to as the bad part of town. You see, racism, where I'm from, is so casual, it's hidden. Hidden in plain sight. I didn't know it existed. The N-word was daily vocabulary. I didn't even know that was a bad word. Growing up, I learned that people who sag their pants are thugs. Growing up, I learned if you live in government-assisted housing, it's because you're too lazy to get a job and work hard like us. Growing up, I learned that these people get food stamps and sell drugs. You see, one day, my dad was going on a rant about just that when a guy knocked at my door. So I went and let him in. The guy went and sat with my dad, handed my dad some money. My dad weighed out the right amount of marijuana and gave it back to him, you know, a drug deal. And then my dad took the money from that drug deal and he put it in his wallet, right next to some red, yellow, blue, green food coupons. You may have heard of them, they're called food stamps. Did my dad see the hypocrisy of us having food stamps and selling drugs while he's telling me about these people getting food stamps and selling drugs? No, because my dad would explain it like this. Son, I work hard and I pay taxes, so I deserve these food stamps. And I don't make enough money and I want to provide for you children, so I got to sell these drugs to make ends meet. You see the hypocrisy of that. The cognitive dissonance is cringeworthy. How could my dad, an otherwise intelligent man, be so ignorant? Easy. It's a toxic cycle of white supremacy and white ideology that has survived the test of time. You see, during slavery, only rich white people could afford to enslave other people. But 
to prevent the poor white people from empathizing with the plight of enslaved black people, what the rich white people did was this. They told the poor white people, hey, if you work hard, you can be like us. And what they did was they gave them management positions on the plantation, called them overseers. That way they were more important than the enslaved black people. The idea was simple. You might be poor, but hey, at least you ain't black. That ideology, that mindset has survived the test of time. Fast forward to my dad sitting in the living room ranting about these people with food stamps and drugs while selling drugs and using food stamps. I can hear it. We might be poor, but at least we ain't black. This is a cycle. And understanding that cycle, understanding that context, understanding this history is the key to dismantling white supremacy. Breaking that cycle is the key to defeating racism. Because I want you to understand, and this is very important, that although white America's busy spinning conspiracies of white America being targeted, there's no tangible quantifiable evidence to justify their case. But ironically, the same people that believe that will refute systemic oppression against the black community when there's tangible quantifiable evidence to prove it. The United States Department of Justice statistics show a black man is three times more likely to be killed by the police than a white man. The United States Sentencing Commission has proven that a black offender will receive a 19 percent longer sentence on average than a white offender same crime same criminal background. A black mother is three times four times more likely to die during childbirth than a white mother. 22 percent of black Americans live in poverty only nine percent of white Americans live in poverty. If you're a black American in this country, you're 2.5 times more likely to live in an environmental justice neighborhood. That means you're next to a power plant, next to a waste dump, next to a structure that poses a significant health risk, regardless of your income. These are irrefutable facts, tangible evidence that shows black America is disproportionately disadvantaged in this country, yet the vast majority of white America calls that government lies. Refuse to believe it exists. But yet, somehow, we're the ones being targeted. <laughs> Why? It's easy. Because we have been told by white supremacy that we are the center of the world. If you don't think like me, that's a you problem. If you don't dress like me, that's a you problem. If you don't act like me, if you don't believe like me, if you don't do your hair like me, that's a you problem. Most importantly, if your experience is not like mine, well, that's a you problem. It could not possibly be the system that was built by us, for us. I remember when my son was five years old. He wanted to play baseball, so I signed him up for the local recreational league team. First things first, we got to go buy a baseball glove, you know. So I take him out, and at the very first store, I ran into a problem, a problem I didn't foresee coming. I told my son, I said, pick out whatever glove you want, son. I want you to be happy with your equipment. So he picked out a glove, but then it turns out I couldn't buy that one for him because he's left-handed. And then he picked out another glove, another glove, and continually couldn't buy him. He had to settle for his fourth choice because, well, they didn't have any for left-handed players. As a right-handed person, I had never really thought of this. As a right-handed person, I never came across this kind of inconvenience. Now, my son picking out baseball gloves is a far cry from the life and death reality of not being white in America, but it's important to point out that in this America that was made with white supremacy woven in every fabric of every system, these standards of whiteness have been passed down. It's easy for us as white Americans to not see the pain the inconvenience, the discomfort, and the danger of our non-white fellow Americans that are living in the very same country. I remember when I was 10 years old, I asked my dad, I said, Dad, what does the South will rise again mean? It was on the flag in the front yard. And it was on people's t-shirts and bumper stickers. And everywhere I went, South will rise again. Everybody knew something I didn't know, so I wanted to know what was going on. My dad looked at me and said, son, one day, it's going to be illegal to be white in this country. It's going to be illegal to be Christian in this country. It's going to be illegal to be straight in this country. And when that happened, 
straight, white, Christian men are going to have to stand up and fight for our freedom just like our forefathers did. And my dad believed that. When he told me that when I was 10 years old, I believed it. So you see, when you juxtapose that ideology with the ramblings of Trump cultists and QA non-conspiracists, you start to see this is not a new phenomenon. These ideas, these conspiracies, these standards of whiteness, they've been around for a long time. My dad believed it and his dad before him. and He told me when I was 10, 30 years ago. It is important that we understand these cycles and what these toxic ideologies are so that we can fight them, so that we can end them. You understand, the way we talk as white Americans, that's the standard. Dialects like African American vernacular English is considered low class and uneducated. The way we wear our hair, that's the standard. I've never had to change my hairstyle so I can go get a job. My hairstyle's never been banned by an employer's manual. Even the way my parents named me is the standard. I don't have to worry about my name on a resume being the reason that my resume is overlooked. All of this is a reality in this country made possible by my white ancestors creating a white system that benefits me. Now, it is worth noting that we've made great progress in the area of civil rights thanks to countless black liberation movements, countless social liberation movements. But even now in 2022, racism and white supremacy still very much exist. I aim to defeat it before I die. The way I do that, I spent the, la I spent the majority of the last two decades trying to understand white supremacy, but more important, trying to understand how it continues to thrive in my community. I came to three conclusions that I think are very important. This is the reason that white supremacy stays alive in our country. Number one, it goes unchecked. These, every white person that's listening to this, in this room or in this country has heard a joke behind closed doors or has heard these baseless conspiracy theories that I'm talking about being spread, or has heard about how reverse racism is attacking white America. And as a white person, if you do not call that out, if your family, friends, co-workers are doing these things and you say nothing, you are an accessory to murder. Your silence allows these hateful ideologies, conspiracies, and dangerous rhetoric to continue to fester and be passed down to the next generation of white supremacists. Your silence is quite literally violence. Number two, lack of education. 99% of white America look at dead in the face right now and say, I'm not a racist. 98% of them couldn't define what racism is. Our entire American education system is whitewashed. Even our history books, they're nothing more than romantic fiction novels in which all the heroes are white. It is our civil responsibility, our duty, to combine our collective voices and demand that our education curriculum be revised, revamped. That our history books tell the truth about the rights and wrongs of yesteryear so that we can have less wrongs and more rights in the years to come. And number three, I saved this to, for last because it's the most important in my book, equity and inclusion. If we aim to dismantle white supremacy, then white Americans must stop treating equity and inclusion as a personal attack on us. There's been tons of legislation that's been passed to demand legal equality. 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment, Voting Rights Act of 1865, Voting Rights Act of 1965, Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, vote, uh, Civil Rights Act 1964. We can make a very long list of legislation, but yet without equity and inclusion, the problem still exists today because you cannot legislate morality. It is incumbent upon us to understand these systems and these standards of whiteness that I've referred to today and how they continue to thrive and survive, we must stop the cycle. In this proverbial right-handed world where everybody who's not white is proverbially left-handed, we must understand that the justice system, the policing system, the education system, the medical system, the financial system, the banking system, the prison system, all these systems are being used against our fellow citizens to oppress and marginalize them. We must have radical, ground-up change on every system in America, period. 
white people. Admitting that white supremacy exists is not an attack on us. Admitting that our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents created this system to benefit us is not an attack on us. Stop treating them like that. Admit there's a problem and become part of the solution. We must embrace our fellow human beings. The statistics I provided today, these numbers validate the struggle, the reality of not being white in America. Nobody's asking white people to have less or be less. All that's being asked is that our fellow Americans have and be just as much. Now I could talk for hours on this, but I was only given 15 minutes. So I'm gonna conclude with this. Number one, I implore everybody who heard me say this to look deeper into each one of these topics. But if you're a white person listening to me, then I implore you to do this. Number one, speak up. Without us as white Americans speaking up within our communities and saying no more, no more of the jokes, no more of the let's, let's make fun of other people, no more of these toxic conspiracies, no, let's speak up. My silence will not be compliance in your violence. Until that happens, we can't end white supremacy. Number two, educate yourself. Are you a racist? That's not a yes or no question. Racism is a spectrum. How much do you know about it? Educate yourself. There's so many books, so many great black educators out there that have spoken on this topic. Educate yourself. Dig deeper. Get uncomfortable. And most importantly, educate your children. We've got to raise the change we want to see in the world. And then number three, get involved. We as white people have a privilege in this country to walk into a city council, walk into a school board meeting, and our voice has power. Use your privilege for power. Demand equity and inclusion in your local schools. Demand equity and inclusion in your local city council meetings. Demand equity and inclusion in your budget for your city. We got standardized testing in schools, but we don't have standardized resources. Demand it. This is how we help end white supremacy. I my name is Russell Ellis, and I was a racist. I'm a reformed racist and white supremacist. If I can do it, you can too. Thanks for listening, and thanks for coming to my TED Talk.